isn't falling. And I want to start by asking our citizens to please do not become complacent. Do not become complacent because the rain has stopped. We have been told by the Met Services that we are at the present time on a yellow level alert. We are also told that we are on an orange riverine alert. And therefore it means that at any point in time, the rain can begin pouring again. Because our major rivers are at 80% and in some instances more, it means we have to be so very careful especially those who live in low-lying areas and around rivers because while the water levels will continue to rise we are at spring tide in addition we have water that is still coming down from the hills and therefore it is critical that we pay attention to what the Met Service says to us as well as the ODPM and all other authorities. The weather system, the, more, the, the most difficult part of it has passed us as Invest 91L, but one expects it to turn and become more virulent as we move through the process of the next three days. While the worst has passed us, we must continue to be very vigilant. So this, this alert will go in the first instance, the adverse level will go until 12 on Friday, tomorrow. And in, case, in, in terms of the riverine alert, it will go until 5. One other thing I would want to say is that it is critical, very critical, that we pay attention to all the directives that the ODPM and the Met Service has, have been giving over the past few days so that we would not find ourselves in a situation where we lose lives. At this point in time, I would want to say we are providing all support for Mrs. Lynch and the family who, unfortunately, she would have been swept away in the water. And we stay hopeful and we ask the nation to continue to pray that we do find her safely. Thank, Thank you, you Mrs. Thank you very much, uh, Major General Smart. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not the first time I've appeared before you on behalf of the government. I'd like to indicate that the axis of the system is called Invest 95. It's a system that has organized in the vicinity. We've been tracking it for days. I want to remind that we issued alerts since Tuesday of this week. On Wednesday, the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government put out a public notice. All 14 of our regional uh, coordinates were put together. That's our disaster management units were put together. The Ministry of Works and Transport, the Ministry of National Security, the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, as well as the Ministry of Communications, all of us were in concert since Tuesday. Bearing in mind that the system is not a storm, it's not a tropical depression, what we were treating with is, a, is, a, is an organization of clouds which has now found itself over the eastern um, aspects of Trinidad and Tobago. It's actually at the Eastern Caribbean Sea right now. It's over portions of northern Venezuela. So that axis has passed us. In preparing on Tuesday and Wednesday and in putting out the public releases, we made sure to identify that all 14 uh, disaster management units in the corporations were being managed through head office. And I can tell you that we distributed and called into action. To date, approximately 2,500 sandbags have been distributed, etc. We've had tarpaulins, we've had mattresses. We positioned and located all our assets, as we did before, along the usual suspect areas where landslips and other events happen. In this regard, swim call, the Trinidad Tobago Defense Force, the Trinidad Tobago Police Service, um, WASA, all of our entities, T and Tech, have been in proper coordination. What we did and what we continue to do in systems such as this, we give the alert, we urge people to be proactive, we urge them to take steps. What we experienced so far is a district effect. 
So it's safe to say in the northeast of Trinidad and in certain other parts of Trinidad, we had some significant events. In coordinating that, I can tell you by way of situational uh, report right now that some parts of Trinidad and Tobago are fairly dry, but other parts are not. So let's deal with the yellow weather alert and what happened. In terms of a report, I can tell you right now that between yesterday and today, as the rain came, and if you read the reports, the rain came in a significant downpour within 10 minutes, within 30 minutes, some of our riverine levels went from one feet and two feet um, in depth to six to seven feet. Indeed, Mrs. Lynch suffered um, the fate of trying to cross at a particular point in time when they had gone from two feet in height to six to seven feet in height. That's what you call flash flooding. I'd like to remind that with a significant amount of rainfall coming onto roofs, the roof water runoff is extremely rapid and therefore the water hits our waterways in a very rapid fashion. So we had consistent rainfall finding itself into our waterways. Flash flooding was observed. I can tell you that all 771 of our municipal police were on active duty. They are provided the eyes and ears of what we treat with. You will note, thank the Lord, that fake news is not something that occupies our attention that much largely because of the service operated by the municipal police. And I wish to commend them in their coordination for making sure that they have monitored every single situation. All 14 corporations report on a continuous basis via the municipal police who verify matters. So let's see what happened. We saw between yesterday and today a total of approximately 145 reports of flooding. That was 135 as at yesterday and 10 more today. We saw these things happen between the Arima Borough Corporation, Shaguanas Borough Corporation, the Mayaro uh, Regional Corporation, Sangre Grande, Tunapuna Piaco, and Princess Town. So we didn't see it in San Fernando, we didn't see it in Port of Spain, we didn't see significant activity in other areas. I can tell you, Tunapuna Piaco Regional Corporation had 95 of those events. And Sangre Grande Regional Corporation had 23 of those events alone. In terms of landslips, we've had 30 landslips, all of which are being managed. I wish to stop and compliment all of the regional corporations, and in particular, CPEP that worked straight throughout the night. And all of the coordination happened via members of parliament on all uh, parts of Trinidad, that is both opposition and government. We were in full coordination with each other overnight and we deployed all resources as required. Cleanup operations are in gear. We saw in particular again that Sangre Grande Regional Corporation had 13 of those landslides. Um, we saw uh, Sawa Laventil had eight of them. Diego Martin Regional Corporation had two of them um, and therefore we had again what I'd call a regional um, effect of the weather hitting us. I can confirm that as of now, we've distributed over 2,437 sandbags. I want to remind you that to date, in the last two occasions that I've appeared before you, we distributed well over 50,000 sandbags. So this is a cumulative addition of resources. In the landslip areas, we have positioned assets right across the north coast. And we're warning Trinidad and Tobago that the soil is saturated. And therefore, the risk of land slippage on usual suspect areas is going to be high. That's because there's a heavy amount of water, the weight is in the soil, and therefore the shear mass movement is going to be a factor. So we have to pay attention. The regional corporations have deployed assets. We're building river banks, we're building structures. So permit me to touch on river banks. You'll notice that we've been distributing in blast form, literally everywhere, um, apparently except to the editor of the Express, Drew Brown, you can take note of that. Despite having appeared on TV6 last night, I was quite surprised to see um, the editorial in the Express today talking about napping. Um, perhaps um, that is something that we can pay attention to. But what I'd like to respectfully say is that we certainly believe that once we report 
in the form that we've been reporting and we've mobilized in the manner that we have, that we are keeping our finger on the pulse. And I'd like to respectfully say that the river level advisories are very important. We have reported as of um, 9.30 this morning and then again at 12 noon, the Aripo River is at 32% of capacity. The Aruka River is at 49% of capacity. Caparo is at 67% of capacity. Karani Bamboo Settlement number three is 79% of capacity as at 12 o'clock. El Carmen, Karani River, 102% of capacity, meaning it's breached its banks. North Oropuch, Toko Road, 85% of capacity. South Oropuch, 73% of capacity. I want to tell you that we have the municipal police where we don't have river level monitors in terms of technical capacity. We are literally on site. Gulfview River, Dunlop River, Guaracara River, Wellington Road River, Papuri Road River, Dignity Trace River, Dago Martin River, Crystal Stream vicinity, Penal Debe area rivers, Suit Trace Rivers, SN Erin Road River, that's by the Big Apple Rest and Bar, Guapo Road River, Kaltu Trace River, Martin Salazar Trace River, Navet Village Nariva River, Guayaguayari Road um, Pool River, Mafeking Road River, Cedar Grove Junction, Ot Ottawa River. We literally have people monitoring these things on site with actual reports coming in live on an hourly basis or if there's an event on a faster basis. In terms of our response, all of our uh, positions now feed into riverine or riverine management. We're at orange level. That's number two's alert. Why are we at orange level? Because the runoff of water coming from the sky, hitting roofs, hitting hills, coming into the river, please bear in mind that we have high tide at 2.10 p.m. today. Low tide is going to be at 8.14 p.m. So the tide is high, the water can't get out. Minister of Works and Transport has reported that all of our pumping systems are in order. We had a small incident at the bamboo pump where we had, a, uh, we had to put it down for an hour and a half. It's back up in operation, but all of our pumping and sluicing systems in the rivers are at work. Wasa in this orange Number two, alert for riverine flooding, means that the water is dirty, it's turbid. There's a lot of mud, a lot of it was picked up, it goes to Wasa facilities. Wasa has provided its report, Northeast, Northwest, and Tobago. In terms of the Northeast, that's Cora, La Pastora, McDavid, Akono, Lengua, Aripo, Guanapo, Tompe, Quare, Takarigua, Kumuto, Sans Souci, Grand River, North Orapuch, Matura, Bish, all of these areas are affected. And operations have been stopped. We're engaged in cleaning works. We're looking at the filters. We're looking at the structures. Um, operations are going to come back into gear as soon as the turbidity subsides. So folks, what does this mean? Pay attention to your water conservation. Pay attention to your water usage. When we look to um, the other areas that Wasa has been managing, that's Northwest, Tyrico, Blanchichers, Las Cuevas, La Filette, Rincon, St. Anne's, Lacono, Grand uh, People, Susconosco, Maraval. Again, operation stopped due to cl uh, clog clogging issues, the filters and screens. We have to wait for the turbidity to go down. So basically, we're looking at Northeast and Northwest with Wasa operations on pause because of the water turbidity, meaning there's just dirt in the water. Tobago, Hillsborough West, Highlands Road, Cordland, um, Richmond, Kings Bay. Again, operations stopped. So we're looking, folks, at Tobago. We're looking at Northwest. We're looking at Northeast. The rest of Wasa's operations are in gear. What does that mean to the northern parts, including Tobago? Conserve your water for now. Be wary about how you do it. Now, we've deployed CPEP, the regional corporations. All aspects are at work. All of the disaster management numbers are being widely spread and have been spread. This means that we have to call in, give the alert. We've been asking people 
um, people that engage in communications with their counselors and positions send us pin locations send us pictures and contact details and that has been working well I can give you good news during the course of this month we will be launching our local app that local app will allow you to report things live in one central platform and to know what's happening so the digitization is going to take care of that um, permit me now to treat with how long this is going to be in effect this is going to be in effect till tomorrow we're going into Friday why are we going into Friday it's not over we're dealing with a lot of water we must accept that climate conditions are different right now flash flooding is real you're gonna see the effects of flash flooding our hearts and minds and prayers are with Theresa Lynch and her family we pray as we scour every aspect of the road and, and waterways that are connected together that she has survived being swept away um, if you read some of the news reports the flash flooding took some vehicles within 10 minutes flat um, this is not even a storm um, we have continuously put our structures into gear in fact it's now a common feature of our communication that the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government comes now to address schools schools as you know uh, the Ministry of Education has alluded us to where we stand on schools remember we're dealing with Trinidad and Tobago in the northern parts we've had some effect and we're seeing dry skies right now we're seeing blue skies in some areas and therefore preserving normalcy and routine is a critical aspect of what we're doing the school aspects are continuing um, the ministry gave its um, advisory for today but we're expecting things to be in normal structures unless advised otherwise in due course so respectfully um, I ask for us to continue to prepare continue to communicate remember that the regional corporations are in frontline response the ODPM is at the level of warning us as to where we stand from a whole of system perspective your government comprises a coordinating team for these events it's rural development and local government in conjunction with Minister of Public Utilities in conjunction with Minister of National Security in conjunction with Minister of Works and Transport in conjunction with Minister of Communications the 14 municipal corporations all their disaster management units are in gear they're coordinated from our head office at the rural development and local government structure we have CPEP National Forestry URP we have WASA we have TNTEC Defense Force we have um, all of our structures that are in operation Trinidad Tobago Police Service and very importantly providing accuracy in terms of reports we have the municipal police of Trinidad and Tobago these reside in the municipal corporations and I want to say that they have allowed us to filter real news from fake news so I do hope um, that we can send this information into the proper positions um, I want to thank our meteorologists um, for their participation our weather people um, big heel out to Sigoni and to Colleen who have done a great job and our TTT staff as well that have done a great job in informing the population folks we have to take weather seriously and we have to also expect that there are going to be infractions one thing I'll end with before we go to um, questions I want to tell people stop interfering with public works there was a report coming out of Aruka of a bridge collapse we went we checked the bridge did not collapse we had a walkway which was interfered illegally with somebody went and moved the government's wall and what we happened what happened was the water was diverted and came in illegal intrusions into waterways and affecting public works are going to cause problems I have already warned and I want to tell you that the information has come to my hand already we intend to take legal action against people that interfere with roadways interfere with waterways uh, go in and and interfere with public works because what happens is you impact your neighbors in Pinal Debe where we've not seen significant effect thank the Lord so far woodlands etc 
as I've informed the public already, there are parts of the waterways where private people have gone in and reclaimed land, left a whole two feet of space for the people water to pass through. That's just wrong. And I want to warn you that the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government is taking aggressive action on these matters, as will the Ministry of Works and Transport and other areas that have the legal capacity and proper location to take action. So may I invite your questions um, from members of the media, and in particular the Express? Jill Brown, TV6. Uh, good afternoon, Minister. Um, good afternoon. One of the things I'm wondering about in terms of the issue of sandbags, was there a particular time where that distribution had to end? Um, is it something uh, that you are satisfied with? Uh, because uh, one person had suggested to me whether there should be a later time to allow for persons to collect sandbags. That's my first question. Well, I'll answer your question with the promise that you will make sure that you tell your colleagues um, all of the information so that the reporting can be shared appropriately. I'm sure you're taking your peek on well. But um, the sandbags are really distributed on demand and supply issues. Most importantly, in preparing for this season, um, the, the weather systems that, that, that come around this time of year, we procured the sandbags and we distributed them out. And there are sandbags in circulation. Um, demand and supply also is met by us providing sand at particular locations. We have sand coming from national quarries and from private contractors as well. And what we have going on in this area is um, we close off um, when, when it runs out and then we replenish. But what we've engaged and what we've tried to do is to make sure that there's a continuous supply. Obviously, there may be people from time to time who find themselves in a situation of, you know, saying, I didn't have access to something at a particular point in time. But I want to remind you, in the last couple of months alone, we have distributed 50, 60,000 sandbags already. And therefore, we have, on the back of our cleaning exercises, the Ministry of Works and Transport and their drainage cleaning, and the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, I want to remind you, we have removed almost 50 times the height of the Twin Towers in garbage from our drains. Um, so we're cleaning, we're pushing, we're doing, but Trinidad and Tobago, we need to be serious about making sure that we don't cause our own problems. So Sandbags, Jewel, thank you for the question. Demand and supply, we're trying to make sure that we supply as many as we can. Next up, we have Jensen from Newsday. Hi, good afternoon to all. Um, two questions. I'm not sure if we're doing it uh, two at a time or one at a time and then double back. Sure. Sure. Hello. How, how are we doing it? I could ask both one two. time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. First question, uh, the Minister, you made mention of it with regards to the reports that you received, particularly the... Um, the incident in Aruka with the bridges and you're all receiving reports of people interfering with public um, infrastructure. My question is, in relation to the hills particularly, how many reports do you have of people illegally um, cutting down the hills that are contributing to the flooding? And the second part of that one question, what, if anything, is being done with regards to that? Um, my second question, you also mentioned with regards to schools. Uh, the notice this morning came for many a bit late, uh, sometime around 7 a.m. and thereabouts, when children were either on their way to school or already in school. Um, going forward, tomorrow, are we looking at the, the continuation of no schools? Because you did say that this uh, will be continuing tomorrow as well. Very much, Jensen. Um, can I say schools are on, schools are going to be in gear, um, there is a regular flow of schools tomorrow for sure, unless advised otherwise. Relative to the, um, to the position about schools being um, closed and the notice coming in at, at, at this morning as opposed to last night, I want to remind you 
that we were not dealing with a weather system that was organized. What we were dealing with is a lot of rain that hit portions of Trinidad. And therefore, we could not anticipate what was going to happen. We have to prepare, but you can't just cancel school just like that. Because we've had the COVID experience hit us. We're now back into operations. And we have to measure how the government responds on each occasion. If we close schools every time we go into a yellow alert, we're going to be in trouble because we're in a hurricane season. We have a wet season, we have a dry season. And therefore, we have to be really careful how we organize ourselves because there are many parts of Trinidad that have not been affected. And forgive me for constantly referring to Trinidad. I want to remind you that the THA is responsible for Tobago's response, which is why I only speak about Trinidad on these occasions. So we have to be careful how we monitor our response to schools and other issues, the normalcy of business and schooling operations. And therefore, at orange level, um, you start to get into a different zone. We are still in yellow level. Um, I got a message from uh, Sigoni Mohammed. Um, I thank you for giving me this information. She's reminded that the active tropical wave, which we're calling Invest 91L, is in fact um, now past us, but it's now a potential tropical cyclone 13. So that's where things start to get into different positions, right? Um, the, the issue of um, school information, we discussed it this morning at Cabinet. Right now, the information is that we're going to continue with schools being in gear tomorrow. There is school tomorrow because, thank the Lord, we have not had a difficult experience so far. We're monitoring, we're managing. In the event that reports come back to us as we're constantly feeding back reports, the Minister of Education will, in consultation with the advisors and then go to the Prime Minister, will come back to the nation if there is to be a change. But schools are on. On your first question, you asked about um, illegal cuttings and illegal development or illegal things that affect us. And I'd like to say that, um, yes, there is a significant amount of um, difficulty that we in a, as a country experience um, at the Eastern Main Road in Dabadi area um, near the AAA tire shop. Um, that's where we saw somebody interfere with um, the road. Um, and just decided that this this person just decided that you know he had to get more land and widen his driveway and in widening his driveway on one particular side what we saw is the water being diverted to hit the abutment and this was not spotted because it was surreptitiously done and that caused the water to hit the abutment to hit the pathway the footway next to the bridge so that's an example as to how pervasive it is how widespread it is it's fairly widespread this is why the property tax management is going to reveal a lot of these things because for property tax to come into effect in local government, for us to get the money from property taxes, you have to have a survey of every single property in Trinidad at the same time, which is why the returns have come in. So are we doing something about it? Yes. We're, number one, we're identifying it. Number two, it becomes identifiable in the course of um, property tax rolling out. Do we want property taxes? Yes, because we want to give the corporations the money so that they can spend on the citizens that live in the municipal corporations. So there's a comprehensive, integrated plan of, identify, of identification and action. All right, next up we're going to Rashad Khan from Guardian Media. But Jewel, we did not forget you with your second question, so we will... Forgive spin me. back at you I, I did after forget his second question. You want to remind right. me before we get there? Yeah, yeah. No, he, he has to ask his second okay, question. Sure. So, Rashad, go ahead and then we'll circle back to Jewel. You want to answer Jewel's question one time and then I will ask mine? Yeah, sure. Go ahead, Jewel. All right, thanks, Rashad. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of uh, the issue of coordination between the ODPM, the Met Office, uh, the Ministry, that you lead minister and all the relevant other agencies. Is that uh, being done to a level that allows for things such as a proper advanced notice as best as possible in terms of weather systems and, and any impact thereof? And also just another part of the question 
does this, uh, what happened today, also what happened uh, uh, within the year so far in terms of weather systems give the, or has given the government cause to look at issues such as evacuation plans, uh, which, uh, for example, especially in flood prone areas, uh, so that persons, if needed, can be uh, evacuated in, in a expeditious enough manner, and that there will be locations that will be safe enough for them to weather these types of systems. Oh, th- thank you for that systemic um, analysis, right? So let's get back to where we are. We are dealing with a yellow alert for clouds in the sky where we warned the nation on Tuesday and on Wednesday and on Thursday um, that we needed to prepare. It's not the first time we've done this. And we did that because of the coordination systems that we have between ODPM, the Met Office, and the Ministry. Um, Yes, we do have evacuation plans, etc. when we get into more serious activities, like when we were arranging um, the potential tropical storm hitting us, even before it became, you notice we took a very different approach. We had activated relief centers, shelters. We told people where they were. We didn't take this step here on this occasion because it was not and still is not required. Um, what we have is the first responders at level going to work because what we have is yellow alert on the weather system. The orange alert that we're experiencing is in Riverine. That's the runoff. And we're seeing and we've given you the capacities and we put it publicly where the river stands. So there are all of those systems. You trigger those things when you need to trigger those things, not at yellow alert number one or yellow alert number two, which is just means one comes after the other. We're still at yellow alert. And we have that hierarchy for position. Um, so we do have that. Flood prone areas. Guys, I'm I'm an elected member of parliament that represents people that live in flood-prone areas. I have to tell you that there are many areas where people have literally built inside of the rivers or on reserves or in areas that not only habitually rainfall affects, but habitually flood. And that is part of our squatter regularization program. It's part of our housing and village improvement program, the HVIP program. But people are, of course, in flood-prone areas. As to how we treat with that, we ask people to protect themselves as best as they can. By now, we know the usual suspects of where areas are flooded. But if you look at where the media attends, and rightly so, when people are showing their their status and how they've been affected in some areas, and this is only in some, you can literally see them inside of areas that are very dangerous to build in. There are some significant issues that we have to treat with now that are being addressed. So if you look to the work and the culvert and drainage issues that the government is putting down through the Ministry of Works and Transport, you'll see at Aruka Maloney, you will see at different areas, you'll see that we're looking at upsizing capacity of drainage issues and there's a very large program. The budget this year speaks to a lot of that. I spoke in my contribution about 200% increase, 100% increase on um, funding from the development program perspective for flood mitigation and drainage issues. So we have a very dedicated rollout in that regard and it was something that is um, certainly well coordinated coming out of COVID, coming out of $13 $13 billion in deficit coming out of borrowings to just pay salaries. These are priority issues for the government on a go-forward basis. All right, we move on to Rashad Khan. Hi, morning, every, um, well, afternoon, everybody. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. Okay, so my question um, this month, well, today is for both Mr. Arawi and Mr. Smart. So, Mr. Arawi, as the Minister of Local Government and Rural Development, seeing the impacts that we saw over the past two days, how do you feel about that? And for Mr. Smart, um, is there any sort of post-mortem going to be done on this incident where we can identify exactly what caused some of the damage that we would have seen? Is it just the sheer amount of rainfall in the, the, the nature of the weather event, or is there some infrastructural stuff that may need to be improved? Okay. Thank you so much, Rashad, for that question. Folks, I used to love the rain. 
<laughs> it used to like like the, the, the rainfall and you know things got cooler, etc. That's when I wasn't the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government. Um, any minister that has sat in this seat will tell you that um, when you have to drive that car of responsibility that it, all of this occupies your mind. The Minister of National Security always has the same experience. The Minister of Works and Transport and the Prime Minister always has this experience. Um, so just to tell you how do I feel, I'm very concerned always as to people's welfare and positions. We are. I've been given the responsibility to coordinate these matters, and I can tell you that I speak for the entire cabinet and for the prime minister's position. Um, what I can tell you is if you just trawl the reports that came from people that had their cars swept away in a couple instances, etc., they'll tell you that within 10 minutes flat, the water went from 2 feet to 6 feet. That's what you call flash flooding. And flash flooding, I was explaining to someone recently that flash flooding is a phenomenon that comes with urbanization. The more roofs that we have, the more structures that we have where the rain falls off rapidly into gutters, is the faster that water works its way onto the streets. And when it gets there, it has to move. And therefore, high tide affects you, etc. So we're seeing the effects of urbanization. We're seeing the effects of quarrying on the hills. We're seeing the effects of the improvements that um, people make over time. So yes, it is something that you constantly monitor. But stick a pin for a moment. You're also seeing that countries around the world are experiencing similar situations. I mean, our prayers go out to Pakistan, go out to parts of Europe, even where you're seeing at times not only droughts, but you're seeing significant flash floods, right? So this is something that we're treating with. Everybody talks about the climate change and about the impacts of structures. It is real, and therefore we have to try and find, um, how should I say, a sense of normalcy in difficulty. Not that we are not taking active steps to treat with it. As I've told you, there are upsizing of drainage outflows, and we're making sure that pumps are upgraded, and we've installed river monitors, and we're looking at embankment issues. All of those works are going on. But people need to consciously prepare that in the event of yellow alerts, flash flooding is real. Sometimes it occurs to me that we may be a victim of God is a Trini syndrome where we kind of don't take things seriously until it actually happens. So we didn't even have a storm hit us. We just had heavy rainfall, and that caused significant position. So how do I feel? I'm always concerned about it. I'm very pleased that there's a working system that can go to effect the improvements that are necessary. It requires a dedicated and long-term program. The Ministry of Works and Transport has identified that, and at Rural Development and Local Government, we have developed a very significant arrangement with that, and part of it is the immediacy of response. Um, you did also ask uh, Major General Smart for his point of view, so I'll pass to him. And if I can start off by saying thanks very much for the question. And I will share with you and the national community that approximately two years ago, the ODPM would have gone to the Minister of National Security and he would have taken a recommendation to cabinet, and that would have been for us to establish what we call the National Disaster Prevention and Preparedness Multisectoral Committee. And given what has happened, and whenever these events take place, this committee meets. It doesn't meet only because of this. It meets throughout the year. But this committee will place focus on exactly what you asked. How are we to learn lessons from this situation? And what are the remedial actions that we are going to take? We would ask the Ministry of Works and Transport to lead in this regard. Because when you look at the situation, just looking at it, you recognize that it is something where, we, we, as the Minister would have indicated, we're speaking about upsizing drainage capacity, etc. So this committee will meet, uh, as it always does after these incidents, and come up and make recommendations on how we can treat with this situation. So thanks again for the question. Can I add one thing in? And I thank a uh, commentator who just um, plugged in. 
number one, please have a look at our social media pages. You'll see a lot of information. Folks, you know what part of the new normal involves? Paying attention to rain and high tide and low tide. It is the reason why flash flooding stays uh, for any period of time because the outflow is really always going to be high tide and low tide related. So please let's pay attention. And another very important thing, please don't take foolish chances. Don't cross and think that you're okay. Don't drive your car into flooded water. Don't wade across a bridge where the water is just rushing. You know, we need to be careful. There's a reason why we put out these notices. If you look at what the ODPM sends out and the Met Office sends out and Rural Development sends out, we warn people about flash flooding all the time. We have to take these things seriously. We saw in some events past the tragedy of a young man ignoring um, everybody telling him not to drive across a flood area. And unfortunately, he made that trek and lost his life. We don't want to see those things happen. So folks, please let's pay attention to the information that comes out. Please go and have a look at our social media um, pages and positions. And we're asking for communication of common sense in, in a more generous way. Um, next, we go to Sarah Chandu for 103. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sarah Chandu from 103FM. I do apologize. I've been having some technical difficulties, so I hope this isn't something that was raised previously. Uh, Minister, you spoke just now about the matter of some houses where they are built, and you mentioned squatting. But some do argue and would argue that maybe not enough is being done to regulate construction sometimes to even ensure contractors aren't clogging up waterways. A few years back, we had an instance where I believe a, a, a waterway in um, St. Augustine was clogged with bamboo residency. It was thrown there by a contractor. Um, could you comment on that, please? Thank you. Yes, um, thank you so much. It wasn't raised, so thank you for your question. Um, see something, say something. Illegal uh, activity in water courses and on roadways, you need to report it. Um, it's the only way that attention can come. We had a situation with um, the Ministry of Works and Transport being able to build walls on one side of a drain and couldn't build on the other side because they'll have to take people to court on compulsory acquisition because nobody would give up the space to do the work that is required. So you have the peculiarity of land ownership in this country, but Part of what we at Rural Development and local government are going to do, we're going to put in that anonymous hotline where you can relay information about illegal activity. If you see dumping going on in the river, that's a serious matter. If you see somebody encroaching on the waterway, into the waterway, that's a serious matter. And certainly from my part in exercising the control in law that I have at Rural Development and local government, you're going to see a lot of action coming in conjunction with the Ministry of Works and Transport because we are coordinating our relief together. All right, we move on to Kim Bodran from Express. Kim? Kim, are you hearing us? Hello? Yes, we're hearing you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Good evening. I, I can't hear you at, well at all. Kim Bodrown from the Express. Minister, I, please forgive if I'm asking you to repeat yourself because there was some issue there with communication. You did speak about the Prime Minister and his presence in this uh, scenario and that you speak on his behalf and the off of the government as well when you appear. But, um, I mean, you know, a lot of citizens are, are out there saying that they would they would like him to reach out to them and be physically present, maybe visit the communities, um, maybe tour the areas, speak to speak to the people. And and we see what you are saying about development. But then, when, of course, when this is happening to people, it is a different story. So I may be asking you to repeat yourself, but please, can we say if we will see the prime minister visiting some communities? Thank you, Kim. Um, I, I can say in response, I see the prime minister publicly all the time. Um, I noticed that uh, the PM is on the field. 
Um, I want to remind you that on this particular occasion, we're actually, the only reason I'm in a suit appearing before you is that I'm compelled to go to the parliament right now because the opposition wants to examine the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government head 42 for hours. They want to interrogate the figures as to probably why they got hundreds of percentages of more money um, for roads and for drainage and for other aspects. So we are all locked in the parliament cycle. We're going to be in the Standing Finance Committee today, tomorrow, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday. And we also then have to head to the Senate. So unfortunately, we're in the parliament cycle and our friends opposite are entitled to ask their questions under the standing orders and we are obliged to answer and to provide transparency on the figures that we manage. So that's one of the reasons that I'd like you to factor as to what's going on. I can tell you that the minute I've answered, I will certainly be on the field as my colleague Rohan Sinanan just called me from behind a drain that Ministry of Works and Transport is, is literally organizing. So we are on the field. Um, and all of the chairmen, I, I want to I tell you this, the one time that you see a, a unified approach politically is in local government, rural development and local government, because we are in constant touch. I had Khadija Amin sending me hundreds of PIN reports, uh, many PIN reports last night. I had Rai Ragbeer, I have Marvin Gonzalez, I have Lisa Morris Julian, I have every member of parliament and all local government representatives, Chairman Jutaram reached out. Um, they are literally on the phone constantly with us and that way we coordinate relief and exercises. So your elected members and your appointed members are certainly on the field, Kim. Right, so we move on now to the final round of question. Jewel Brown. Yes, uh, just two things quickly. One, um, to uh with regard to the ODA, odpm uh does it have everything that it needs to execute all of uh, the functions that it, it it is supposed to do um that's one uh, especially at times uh, with terms of serious weather issues and so on uh, secondly um to you minister in terms of the disaster response units in the local government uh the corporations uh, are they satisfactorily a resource, uh, not just in terms of initial response, but also in the cleanup thereafter, uh, as what we have uh, obtained yesterday, for example. Can I reverse the order of response, just to say, the, and, and Major General Smart, Smart will speak for himself, right? The ODPM comes in later. The first responder is the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, because we are the regional corporations. So how it works is Met Office advises. ODPM assesses, communication happens, intra-government, etc. We trigger our activation. So rural development and local government, we have 30,000 employees, literally, if you calculate it in a particular way. 14 regional corporations. We have CPEP, we have National Forestry, we have Rural Development Company, and then we have linkages under Section 235, if I remember them correct, in the um, Municipal Corporations Act. We have linkages in coordinating matters between WASA, um, TNTech, etc. So we're the first responders that go into gear. In terms of resources, if we didn't have the resources to clean up, you would have heard about it the time before, and the time before that, and the time before that. So when events happen, we go to work in cleaning, in cleansing, in positioning, right? Because you have to prepare, you have to survive the eventualities of what goes on. In other words, then you have to experience it. And then the assessment of works is done and then the perfection of works goes into effect. So we do have resources there, which is why we distribute resources in the manner that we do. Be it sandbags, be it cots, be it mattresses, be it food supplies, all of these things are dealt with. Cleaning, we get people on site, we get hoses, we get sanitation, we do all of that stuff. So the way in which we manage the resources is inside of there. There are certain instances where we also have to assess, do we have the locus, do we have the position in law to do the thing? Because you have to remember there's a difference between the public work and the private work. So um, a, a, a collapse on a private home is a very different thing from a collapse on a public home. That's where we kick in our coordination with Ministry of Social Development, 
where we have relief for housing, where we pay for rental for three or four months, we relocate people, all of those things happen, and therefore the Ministry of Social Development gets involved and matters happen that way. So there is a complete system of operation. Do we have enough money for everything to be done all the time? That's a matter of management. And obviously we do not have an elastic budget. We have a very precise budget, especially coming out of COVID. So the budget this year is 56 odd billion dollars. And what we do know is what we're gonna do with that budget. But there is no inelasticity um, that, that, that we can avoid. We have to make sure that we, we, we recognize that there's only a certain amount. Obviously, there are emergencies that we can trigger and that we have emergency expenditure and then the government makes decisions from time to time depending upon that. So there is a full system. But it isn't that ODPM goes into gear first in terms of on the ground management. That's not how the system is structured. But let me pass it over to Major General Smart to, to give his perspective on that. Thank you very much, Minister. And if I can start where you ended, what happens before an event? So on Tuesday, the ODPM will have already begun coordinating with all our national agencies with regard to what we anticipated would have been happening. So as part of the whole process, the Ministry of Rural Development and Local Government, along with the Tobago Emergency Management Agency, the Fire Service, the Defense Force, TSTT, Digicel, all these agencies, national as well as nationally um, inclined agencies, and I say inclined because we talk about private and public sector agencies, but that, has, that have national effects, so Digicel as an example, while not a government agency, but because of the critical role it plays, all these agencies would have been brought together in a briefing. We call it the National Emergency Operations Center briefing because we're anticipating what could happen and making sure that all these agencies are ready to respond. So we are quite aware before an incident, the state of readiness of all our agencies. We are very aware as well of the situation that they find themselves in. So that if there is a need to move resources anywhere to support each other, we can do that. So that is one of the strengths that a lot of countries admire about Trinidad and Tobago, that we are able through this National Disaster Pre Prevention and Preparedness Multisectoral Committee, all these government agencies, as well as through the National Emergency Operations Center, we are able to bring agencies together so that we can respond to what the med service is telling us is going to happen and we're not only just responding to what we're seeing but we respond to what are other possibilities so we're looking at second and third order effects of what could happen specific to the question that you asked the odpm will always want all that the government gives and more. But do we have what we need now? Certainly we do. And I want to share that the ODPM is transforming the disaster management sector. And in addition to what we get from the government, we are fortunate as well because of how we have positioned ourselves as a sub-regional focal point for the region, the southern subsector. We get support from the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency. In fact, just recently, Cabinet agreed that the ODPM, through the Minister of National Security, can accept funding from CEDEMA for us to do a project in Trinidad as well as a project in Tobago. So through these mechanisms, we are able to improve whatever we get that is allocated to the ODPM from the budget. So do we have what we need right now? Yes. Are we going to ask the Minister of National Security and the Minister of Rural Development and Local Government here to represent us more in the cabinet? Yes, we're going to, because we want to make sure Trinidad and Tobago becomes the most resilient state in the Caribbean. 
through the support of the government funding as well as support from all of our friends and partners in the region. And here, let me just make one more point. In fact, two points. Last week, we had a delegation from United Nations Disaster Risk Reduction Center. And that delegation is offering to Trinidad and Tobago the possibility of, de of developing an information center that is going to collate information from all these various agencies into this one hub. And we are then able to build faster and better this information exchange. That is going to present, be presented to Trinidad and Tobago at no cost to Trinidad and, and Tobago. And I would, and my last point, while we speak of government, I want to highlight the role of the private sector as well, and the non-NGOs, the non-governmental organizations. Yesterday evening, while all was happening, we would have received a signal from Sewa Titi, one of our NGO partners, who was offering to provide subway sandwiches to all persons who are involved and who may have been impacted as well, so that some measure of relief would have been provided to individuals and communities. We were able, through that system, to send to have 100 sandwiches delivered to Tima. So here is Sewa Titi, an organization, an NGO saying, we can help. And at the same time, I was receiving a call from the American Chamber, who was saying, let us know how we can help if there's anything we can do. So the, the, the needs of the ODPM doesn't just extend from where what we get to the budgetary allocation, but from the support we get from partners such as NGOs, Red Cross, um, as a national agency, as well as the private sector. I Thank hope I answered the question. Thank you so much, Major General Smart. Um, folks, it's now my turn to just basically wrap up. Um, I want to thank a um, particular expert who's just reminded me that there's something called an intensity, duration, frequency curve. What does that mean? Cycles of when events happen. A 10-year storm, a 15-year storm, a 25-year storm, a 100-year storm. You saw what happened in the United States with um, Hurricane Ian. Um, and you saw them refer to it as the worst event in a hundred years. We're now in that category where we have to be contemplating that they're going to be acts of God, as they're called, where you're going to have some significant impact. And sometimes we have to also recognize that we have to make sure that we're preparing for how we react to things. The takeaway from today's conference is please take the warnings seriously. If your neighbor calls you and tells you, boy, water rose six feet in 10 minutes, hurry up and move your car. If you can, safely. Don't traverse an area that is unsafe. Don't cross a bridge that is underwater. Don't drive your car into a road where you cannot see where you're going. Those are dangerous things to do. Take advantage of preparing your homes. There are sandbags, there are position works. And also too, very importantly, if you see something, say something report even if it is anonymously because of your safety concerns report when you see people encroaching into waterways or affecting the roadworks etc these are critical issues very shortly we'll have some of that in your hands on an easier basis with our local app but basically please let's bear in mind that events are real we did not deal with a storm we did not deal with a tropical depression. We did not deal with a cyclone. We did not deal with a hurricane. We dealt with weather. We dealt with a lot of rain that we provided notice about. Uh, we, we, we went into yellow alert on Tuesday, Wednesday, etc., and we warned. It just means that we have to take these things carefully and seriously. So may I, on behalf of us all this afternoon, thank you sincerely for coming um, to this event and for asking your questions, members of the media. Um, I do hope that we have satisfactorily answered your questions. To our good citizens in Trinidad and Tobago, please continue to reach out and let us know how we may be of assistance. And may God bless you all. Thank you.
All right, thank you for joining us at today's media conference. Please remember to exercise all precaution in flood-prone areas and stay